I would like to invite our panelists, uh, Professor Michael Gaetzo, Professor Tom Meyer, and Professor Moti Ashkovitz, please join me on this one. The main challenges in the quest for oil alternative are in science and technology. However, most of the panels uh, were focused on the ecosystem and on regula uh, regulatory acts, on economical aspects, and less on the science itself. Uh, in this panel, we shall try to rectify this uh, fact uh, a little bit. And uh, we shall give, uh, during the panel, a three short presentation uh, regarding the science behind the wheel. Uh, our three panelists are the two uh, 2014 uh, Eric and Sheila Samson Award, uh, Professor Michael Goetzel and Professor Thomas Meyer. Uh, they, their work focused on some extremely interesting and intriguing aspect of the technology, which is trying to imitate the natural photosynthesis process, what you call artificial photosynthesis. And the first, especially the first step in the PSA2 cycle, which is the water splitting, solar assisted water splitting into hydrogen and oxygen. This uh, fascinating subject uh, that we'll discuss by the first two uh, awardees of the uh, Samsung uh, Award. Uh, it will be followed by uh, Professor Moti Eskovich, who dedicated uh, the last uh, few years, I think, in uh, promoting the conversion of CO2 and water into syngas and alternative fuel uh, production of hydrocarbon based on the simplest uh, gases that we have in nature, the CO2 and the, and, and the water. Uh, f uh, during this lecture, it will be followed by uh, a small discussion, and I hope that people will uh, act according to the system that we have here and submit their questions, and we shall leave some time for a question and answers from the audience. Uh, we shall start with uh, Professor Michael Gretzel. My, Professor Gretzel is the uh, director of the Photonic Laboratory at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, he is extremely well known, and I, can I list, should I list the, all the list of awards no, you received? Okay. okay, let us save the time. Professor Gretzel, please. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to share with you during these next few minutes the, uh, some of the uh, results we have in our research. This uh, opening slide shows you actually one product we have developed using mesoscopic disensitized systems. It's, it's a Congress Center wall in, in Lausanne, the first large-scale project, showing the success of mimicking photosynthesis. This system uses a molecular sensitizer as, as the plant does in, using chlorophyll to generate electricity from light. But our uh, lecture this morning is focused on fuels, and so uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be talking about photoelectrochemical cells, the PECs. And there we have uh, two different approaches. I will be mainly speaking about metal oxide photoelectrodes. And I think Tom, he will be turning to molecular systems and uh, talk to you about how we can really mimic natural photosynthesis. And so the, uh, the PAC is actually uh, the only system that takes sunlight, uh, the energy out of sunlight to split water into hydrogen oxygen. Then hydrogen can be used as a vector to, to uh, for example, make fuels, methanol, or, or hydrocarbons. And uh, so that's a key, a, a key renewable uh, strategy to use the photoelectrochemical approach. And so what's the essence of our invention? Well, 
If you take a material like iron oxide, which is a semiconductor, well, usually it's, uh, it, it's inactive. It doesn't uh, produce any oxygen or, or, or hydrogen from water. It's just dead. But uh, the reason for that is the, the, the light is absorbed, and uh, positive and negative charges are, are generated in the rust, but they recombine very quickly. You can't get them to do any, any chemistry for you. And so the, uh, the key advantage of using the mesoscopic architecture that, that is our invention is that we shorten the, the by using nanostructured systems like this cauliflower iron oxide structure, we shorten the diffusion path to a few nanometers, and hence you're able to capture those carriers that produce under sunlight to do chemistry, in this case, the oxidation of water to, to oxygen. And so that reaction is shown here. So when we excite the iron oxide, well, it, if you use rust, it doesn't do a thing for you. Uh, if you haven't seen rust uh, decomposing water, bubbles coming out of rust. But uh, the reason for that is the excitation followed by very rapid uh, recombination. And so no carriers uh, can perform the chemistry like oxid oxidizing the oxidation of water by the positive charge of valence band holes. And so, but if we can... When they can be applied. CO2 is not a problem. CO2, there are mature technologies, there are novel technologies, and the cost of recovering CO2 is marginal when you compare it with the other, with the other costs that are attached to it. So we should move forward, and we should move forward to implement it. And the way, and ideally, would be if we could use renewable energy either through electrolysis as it develops or through uh, photochem photochemical elect uh, electrical um, uh, technologies that were presented today or other technologies that are developed to be able to split water and then go to a process which we develop, and I presented this last year at the, at the conference here, to take just the CO2, to take the hydrogen, and make renewable liquid fuels, make mixtures of hydrocarbons that can replace the three major uh, liquid fuels for transportation. Now, this particular technology is uh, developed now in the lab scale, and we're ready now to move to a, to a um, larger scale. And indeed, we have some partners that uh, are working with the different aspects of it with us. And we're very hopeful that indeed we'll be able to move forward relatively fast. Still, to implement this directly, we would need relatively low cost hydrogen, which is still a major challenge. And so, and so to be able to move forward in this environment that does require you know, low cost hydrogen, um, we decided to now shift a little bit also to the possibility of using natural gas and probably remote natural gas in places which is, which is maybe difficult to recover or it's rather expensive to recover it and try to bypass to some extent the issue of hydrogen, uh, of hydrogen uh, generation from water to bypass it for, for the time being, use it directly combine it here with CO2, with CO2, and produce the liquid fuels. So in summary, I think that there, there should be more efforts to try to use the upcoming and the novel technologies for producing hydrogen, which sooner or later will become uh, economical and sustainable, and combine them with CO2 to make liquid fuels. Thank you very much. Thank you, all our speakers. Are there any questions yet? Or maybe you should leave a few, few more seconds for people from the audience um, to ask unfortunately questions. Unfortunately, we're running a bit late, so regrettably, we're not going to have time for questions. We've got a coffee break, um, and everyone can come back uh, to start yeah. sharply again at 10.30. But uh, I would like to ask one question okay. at least, OK? Go ahead. <laughs> uh, you see, we realize uh, here for a long time that there is no silver bullet for solution, a single single bullet for all needs of for fuels for trans uh, transportation. Uh, some solution may be needed for different device, 
and sometimes some solutions may be adequate on different time scale because not all technologies are available right now. Let's, I would like you to let free your imagination and say what you wish and what you think will be the future. Let it put it on a time scale, and what do you see in first step, second step, and uh, what you, is your vision for the far future. Please let us start. Yes. Let me start. Can you hear this one? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Just a couple of observations that are unavoidable. The impact of carbon dioxide becomes more compelling. I showed you flood maps. This problem will not go away. And any time you burn a carbon fuel, you produce carbon dioxide. And unfortunately, when you're doing carbon fuels for transportation, it's almost impossible to capture the carbon dioxide as it's, as it's emitted. So long term, <clears throat> I think that the, the prospects for transportation, obviously based on electricity, is obvious. We have in the developed countries an existing grid system. We have the capability for generating the fuels. We simply need to continue to evolve the battery technology. Very, very important point. The other is, again, going back to hydrogen. Hydrogen, if we combine it with the this, this solar techniques we've talked about, uh, the cost really could come down remarkably. If that happens, then the challenge for transportation, and this is the second challenge, would be to solve the problem of storing hydrogen in a small space. It's a gas. It's very difficult to compress. If that problem gets solved technologically, as soon as 10 or 15 years from now, transportation would change overnight. But as the pressure mounts on carbon dioxide, Carbon fuels will be difficult to say sustain for transportation or anything. It's, uh, it, as I said, the water splitting, uh, as the last speaker also mentioned, the water splitting is really the holy grail uh, that uh, it remains it. We have to especially scale up. I mean, on a laboratory scale, this works well and now uh, we have to, to gather more experience and a scale up, but also the fundamental research needs to be much more enhanced. This research has been funded to the tune of the oil barrel price. Okay? And in uh, 1984, our funding was zero because the oil barrel price was four dollars. And so, uh, so, so that has to stop. There has to be some, some trust in the scientists that have now shown remarkable success. And I think that at the end, we want to mimic the natural photosynthesis in capture on CO2 and spitting water. But, uh, but many people regard uh, regards the hydrogen as a primary energy source. We can use this either directly through fuel cells, produce electricity, or to use it with uh, CO and produce later hydrocarbons. And this is... Uh, and, and this is... Uh, something that is questionable what would be the right uh, dimensions because uh, Moti just mentioned before the, that you can't compete with the energy uh, density in, of the hydrocarbons. But uh, Moti, please refer to it. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, I'll be very brief because, uh, you know, for sure they were out of time. But uh, again, as I said, if we have a CO2 problem and one can produce the, the hydrogen, and there is a technology, and there will be many technologies, I believe, to, to combine the two and to make liquid fuels and to store them and to use the current infrastructure because I understand there is an effort to build new infrastructure for natural gas and for the others and for the others. But this is okay for the developed countries. It's not so, so clear what happens in China or in India or in other places. So although the interim solution is with the biological fuel, with the biofuels and the others, ultimately, we should think for something down the road, sustainably, and I hope that this is going to happen soon. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank all our panelists again. Thank you, Moti, Tom, and Michael. National effort in the U.S. that dealt with climate change issues. This is a marker, 400 parts per million, because Past this point, climate uncertainties begin. Uh, thermal increases in the background begin to become an issue. It's projected conservatively by 2,100. Sea levels may rise six to seven feet. This is a flood map at the left. Uh, New York at five feet of 
of ocean is uh, underwater by about 30 or 40 percent. The bottom is even worse at Shanghai. Uh, at two meters, 70 percent of Shanghai is underwater. It's built on a river delta. So the, the prize this year for Michael and I are, I think, oriented towards the fact that there are different and new approaches that should and can be explored. They've come out of chemistry and physics and material science. Our approach to this is much like Michael's. Uh, we're looking, though, at the possibility first of, look at the targets, driving these very simple reactions first, uh, the water splitting reaction. Uh, notice at the top, what a wonderful reaction. We have plenty of water. Water is the fuel source. Use the sun and break it into hydrogen and oxygen, and then recombine it. Huge amounts of energy storage. Or at the bottom, our second target. Uh, carbon dioxide is this, is this greenhouse gas that's building up. Let's turn it around and use it as a fuel source. Use water as a reducing agent in a chemical parlance and react it with the CO2 and hopefully make hydrocarbons that we then plug straight back into our existing hydrogen carbon transportation economy. Uh, so that's where we are. The hydrogen splitting reaction is obviously very appealing. But I would make the point to those of you interested in transportation, you can build large structures, and I'll talk about it in a moment, uh, where the world's economy uses high massive amounts for energy storage. The key for solar energy is energy storage in the end, because the sun goes down at night, and you need a way to can have continuous power supply. <clears throat> and a stationary application, hydrogen's fine. The continuing problem is, even though there is a Toyota fuel cell and has a fuel cell car running on hydrogen, and has been for 10 years. I drove it in Los Alamos 10 years ago. <clears throat> the problem of storage is basically unsolved in massive scales. We need a way to store the hydrogen. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the technical details here. Again, based uh, in large part on some of the principles that Michael developed. Uh, our goal on this, <clears throat> I show a cell. Uh, it's a, a kind of an engineering drawing where part of the sunlight would, would strike this cell, a thin bed reactor. Uh, and at one side, water, in fact, gets oxidized, so that's one source of the oxygen in the first slide, bubbles coming off. In the other, I show, though, the, the second target reaction, and that is to take this dreaded greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, again, as a fuel source, <clears throat> and convert it into something useful. And we're very much uh, into this, this part of the project, mainly from the electrochemical point of view. Plug it into the circuit, uh, because we don't have the cell constructed, but we can still do the chemistry. At the right, you see two targets. One is reduction of CO2 to formate. Uh, this has appeal. So if you look at the right, there's this PEC, this photoelectrochemical cell. Uh, sunlight gets absorbed. Carbon dioxide gets converted into formic acid. There is an existing technology for formic acid reacting with oxygen, but indirectly in a fuel cell. And so here's a potential power source. <clears throat> and that, in fact, could be a closed system if you're off-grid, if you're in an isolated place capture the CO2 and run the system forever. On the left, we begin to plug in with this thinking into the existing energy economy. In that case, we look at the possibility of reducing carbon dioxide and water to so-called syngas, mixtures of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. And we know how to do this. We have good catalysts for this. We're looking at the prospects of a startup company. Uh, and <clears throat> I think the prospects here uh, for profitability are, are relatively high. Uh, some other thinking go back to hydrogen. And hydrogen, in fact, has been stored in large amounts for this stationary application that I mentioned, is in fact quite appealing. If you look at the, at the graph at the top uh, and, and find the place that's marked with the red box, that's hydrogen storage estimates. And compared to other ways to store energy, it's just fine. Uh, for us and our photoelectrochemical approach, uh, our goal, our break even point is about $5 a kilogram uh, in hydrogen production. Finally, we're again looking at this pretty carefully from the perspective of developing a new technology that we can commercialize as soon as possible in places where the technology is needed. And I would point out that, you know, this may not be New York City, but in the beginning, there are places almost right now uh, that would benefit from technologies of this kind. And here I show pictures of them. Obviously, if you are a military organization or another that works in places uh, far from, far from the center, uh, you need power, and how do you get your power? If you could use solar energy and convert to these chemicals and use them, uh, then you have a power source. 
clean energy for the third world. Although this is you know, a market that we don't pay much attention to, there are many parts of the world where there is no grid, there is no infrastructure. So this is a way to get isolated communities or communities without a grid structure uh, the energy they need. Uh, the obvious clean energy for remote islands and off-grid communities. And I just came from a meeting in Japan on this theme, but not a research focus, energy independence for island nations, including, as the example, Japan. It's chosen to close down its nuclear industry and has no real hydrocarbons. So let me just say in closing uh, that I, I think uh, that Michael and I, in fact, fit in this session in the sense of being hopefully providers of fuels for those of you uh, in the audience who think about where to go next. Thank you. Last uh, but not least, uh, Professor Marty Ashkovitz uh, from Ben Gurion University, until lately the Vice President for Research in the University, and also till late uh, the Head of the Energy Commission of uh, the Israeli Council for Research and Development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shlomo. Thank you. Good morning. Well, it's a pleasure to be here this morning uh, to discuss this very important topic. And as a matter of fact, if we look at liquid fuels, they're just a mixture of hydrocarbons. So all we need is really hydrogen and uh, carbon. And uh, well, we, th there is plenty of carbon dioxide that contains carbon. The question is how to use it, because actually we're trying to get rid of it, because it does create all these environmental problems. And the hydrogen, obviously, can be produced from water. And really, the key to all this effort of getting renewable and sustainable um, liquid fuels is really to be able to produce hydrogen from water, which is a very well-known process, has been practiced for many, many, many years, uh, how to split water, and the real question is how to do it uh, economically, sustainably, and can be done in large scale. And so, you know, this is just, uh, just, this just shows all the liquid fuels. So although I appreciate and I fully agree with the fact that we need multiple solutions, but still, we have to remember that, you know, uh, sorry, that, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you know, people talk about methanol, people talk about other types of liquids, but we should remember that there is a significant advantage to the liquid fuels that we use right now you know, the diesel, the gasoline, certainly the jet fuel that we cannot replace as such. And so there, I think there should be a sustainable effort to convert carbon dioxide, which is plentifully available, and hydrogen, which will hopefully be able to produce at relatively low cost, to combine them rather than to methanol, or certainly not to methane, which is just natural gas, but to try to make out of them liquid fuels. And so, you know, the, you know very well this, the, 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 those types of predictions. And, you know, they're not, very, they're, they're not very optimistic, as a matter of fact. And this is just one, but they all look pretty much the same, which means that actually the contribution of the biofuels all the way to, to 2040 will be kind of marginal. So it means that, you know, and given the fact that, you know, the current belief is that there is a lot of remaining uh, crude in the ground one way or the other that may be more expensive to get out but still there, then we have to find some other ways of doing things, something that will be game changing. And, uh, you know, the environmental issue is there. You know, the reports that are coming out of the UN and the others are very, very pessimistic about it. And the real question is when, you know, some kind of an environmental disaster will happen. We, we really don't know how to say that, but the predictions are not very, very optimistic about that. So what, what, are, what are the options? Ultimately, the options are either to go to natural gas or to coal and, you know, fissure trop processes now how to convert this to liquid fuels, or you can go to biomass and, and convert that, you know, again, through, through all kinds of processes. And there are many existing today to, to something that would look like liquid fuels, or to maybe do this water splitting plus the carbon dioxide hydrogenation, which is certainly sustainable. So this picture here summarizes what you heard from the 
uh, from the two speakers, you know, about the prospect of splitting water, and you know, we're all very hopeful that this is going to happen very soon. And you know, this this particular paper here by two by by several authors here, which are well known in the field, do ask the question. You know, will uh, solar-driven water splitting devices will see the light of day, and we hope this is going to happen very soon. And you know, you heard some numbers here, and I would say that the target for 2020, the way DOE and other organizations said it, is like two dollars a kilogram of hydrogen. And if we reach the target, we'll, we'll be in a very good shape to proceed with the technologies. Now, at this point in time, uh, electrolysis looks does look the most hopeful because of the fact that even today one can build large-scale electrolysis units and run them, and there are several projects that do it, although they're still relatively small scale, but this thing is moving forward quite fast, and there are other technologies, not just the, electroly the electrolytic technologies, but also the PEM technologies and other technologies that are done for this electrolysis. And certainly the, the, the low-cost technologies, some of them are presented here today, uh, you know, they look better, but they do, need, they do need much more development to be able to reach the point when they can be applied. CO2 is not a problem. CO2, there are mature technologies, there are novel technologies, and the cost of recovering CO2 is marginal when you compare it with the other, with the other costs that are attached to it. So we should move forward, and we should move forward to implement it. And the way, and ideally, would be if we could use renewable energy either through electrolysis as it develops or through uh, photochem photochemical elect uh, electrical um, uh, technologies that are presented today or other technologies that are developed to be able to split water and then go to a process which we developed, and I presented this last year at the, at the conference here, to take just the CO2, to take the hydrogen, and make renewable liquid fuels, make mixtures of hydrocarbons that can replace the three major uh, liquid fuels for transportation. Now, this particular technology is uh, developed now in the lab scale, and we're ready now to move to a, to a larger scale. And indeed, we have some partners that uh, are working with the different aspects of it with us, and we're very hopeful that indeed we'll be able to move forward relatively fast. Still, to implement this directly, we would need relatively low-cost hydrogen, which is still a major challenge. And so, and so, to be able to move forward in this environment that does require, you know, low-cost hydrogen, um, we decided to now shift a little bit also to the possibility of using natural gas and probably remote natural gas in places which is, which is maybe difficult to recover or it's rather expensive to recover it and try to bypass to some extent the issue of hydrogen, uh, of hydrogen uh, generation from water to bypass it for, for the time being, use it directly combine it here with CO2, with CO2, and produce the liquid fuels. So in summary, I think that there should be more efforts to try to use the upcoming and the novel technologies for producing hydrogen, which sooner or later will become uh, economical and sustainable, and combine them with CO2 to make liquid fuels. Thank you very much. Thank you, all our speakers. Are there any questions yet? Or maybe you should leave a few, few more seconds for people from the audience um, to ask unfortunately questions. Unfortunately, we're running a bit late, so regrettably, we're not going to have time for questions. We've got a coffee break, um, and everyone can come back uh, to start yeah. sharply again at 10.30. But uh, I would like to ask one question okay. at least, OK? Go ahead. <laughs> uh, you see, we realize uh, here for a long time that there is no silver bullet for solution, a single single bullet for all needs of for fuels for trans uh, transportation. Uh, some solution may be needed for different device, 
and sometimes some solutions may be adequate on different time scale because not all technologies are available right now. Let's, I would like you to let free your imagination and say what you wish and what you think will be the future. Let it put it on a time scale. What do you see in first step, second step, and uh, what you, is your vision for the far future? Please let us start. Yes. Let me just, can you hear this one? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> just a couple of observations that are unavoidable. The impact of carbon dioxide becomes more compelling. I showed you flood maps. This problem will not go away. And any time you burn a carbon fuel, you produce carbon dioxide. And unfortunately, when you're doing carbon fuels for transportation, it's almost impossible to capture the carbon dioxide as it's, as it's emitted. So long term, <clears throat> I think that the, the prospects for transportation, obviously based on electricity, is obvious. We have in the developed countries an existing grid system. We have the capability for generating the fuels. We simply need to continue to evolve the battery technology. Very, very important point. The other is, again, going back to hydrogen. Hydrogen, if we combine it with the, the solar techniques we've talked about, uh, the cost really could come down remarkably. If that happens, then the challenge for transportation, and this is the second challenge, would be to solve the problem of storing hydrogen in a small space. It's a gas. It's very difficult to compress. If that problem gets solved technologically, as soon as 10 or 15 years from now, transportation would change overnight. But as the pressure mounts on carbon dioxide, Carbon fuels will be difficult to say sustain for transportation or anything. It's, uh, it, as I said, the water splitting, uh, as the last speaker also mentioned, the water splitting is really the holy grail uh, that uh, it remains it. We have to especially scale up. I mean, on a laboratory scale, this works well and now uh, we have to, to gather more experience and scale up, but also the fundamental research needs to be much more enhanced. This research has been funded to the tune of the oil barrel price. Okay? And in uh, 1984, our funding was zero because the oil barrel price was $4. And so, uh, so, so that has to stop. There has to be some, some trust in the scientists that have now shown remarkable success. And I think that at the end, we want to mimic the natural photosynthesis in capture on CO2 and spitting water. But, uh, but many people regard the, regards the hydrogen as a primary energy source. We can use this either directly through fuel cells, produce electricity, or to use it with uh, CO and produce later hydrocarbons. And this is... Uh, and, and this is... Uh, something that is questionable what would be the right uh, dimensions because uh, Moti just mentioned before the, that you can't compete with the energy uh, density in, of the hydrocarbons. But uh, Moti, please refer to it. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. and, uh, I'll be very brief because, uh, you know, for sure they were out of time. But uh, again, as I said, if we have a CO2 problem and one can produce the, the hydrogen, and there is a technology, and there will be many technologies, I believe, to, to combine the two and to make liquid fuels and to store them and to use the current infrastructure because I understand there is an effort to build new infrastructure for natural gas and for the others and for the others. But this is okay for the developed countries. It's not so, so clear what happens in China or in India or in other places. So although the interim solution is with the biological fuel, with the biofuels and the others, ultimately, we should think for something down the road sustainably, and I hope that this is going to happen soon. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank all our panelists again. Thank you, Moti, Tom, and Michael.